Now I'm gonna tell you about the autonomic nervous system. I mentioned the autonomic nervous system in passing when I was presenting thermoregulation. And in that mini lecture, I covered this slide, which maps out the control strategy for dealing with cold temperatures. And what we see is that there are two efferent pathways <clears throat> in this control. First of all, shivering emerges by patterns of excitation that come from motor neurons that act on skeletal muscles. Just to add a little bit of uh, jargon here, this is useful. Uh, skeletal muscles and the cutaneous blood vessels are both examples of effector organs. Okay, these are organs along the efferent pathway that are acted upon, in this case, through excitation through, um, through neurons. <clears throat> now, of course, skeletal muscles have uh, conscious uh, control. Okay, generally, you're using your skeletal muscles to move around. In this case, shivering is not um, so much a conscious decision but you're certainly very aware of your skeletal muscles vibrating to create the shivering. In contrast, this sympathetic neurons pathway causes something to occur that you're not generally aware of, which is the vasoconstriction of blood vessels to the skin that um, shunts blood towards the interior of your body. Okay, that's a good idea when you're cold. Sympathetic neurons What's that? Well, it's our first example of an autonomic pathway. That is a piece of the autonomic nervous system. And we can contrast the autonomic pathway, which we are not, do not have conscious control over against the motor neurons, which do offer that conscious control, which is characteristic of the somatic pathway. There's only one type of somatic pathway, and it includes the skeletal muscles as the effector organ. Autonomic pathways are more diverse. There's three major types of autonomic pathways and they have a variety of effector organs. So this mini lecture focuses on that and we address this question. What is the autonomic nervous system? Now we're gonna detail that in this lecture. Let's start off with um, a generic definition. Efferent pathways, so the autonomic nervous system include efferent pathways in the periphery, so not the central nervous system, in the periphery that regulate organ systems that are not under conscious control. Okay, so that excludes the somatic pathway. All the autonomic pathways are not under conscious control. The, among the three pathways, they're recruited depending on your body's level of activity and stress. Let's first consider what happens when you're relaxed, okay? When you're just sitting there, maybe listening to a not too exciting lecture, um, there are a variety of bodily functions that are more active in that situation than when you're moving around or stressed out. So I said that autonomic pathways are in the periphery, but actually the cell bodies of the neurons uh, for the autonomic nervous system reside in the spinal cord, which is, of course, part of the CNS. But because they project out into the periphery, it's technically, that pathway shown in red there is technically part of the periphery, and it's showing us an autonomic pathway. All right, so when you're relaxed, what should your heart be doing? Well, it shouldn't be beating very quickly, so it's not surprising that a low beat frequency is a response that emerges from this pathway here. Okay, um, I'll, I'll explain what that is in a moment, but just know that there's a chemical synapse there, and there are two neurons on this pathway with the final terminating on the heart. And in particular, cells that are responsible for driving heart beats. We'll talk about those later. When you're relaxed and not breathing very heavily, your lung, uh, your lung, the air passageways to, uh, or uh, so your lungs have a branching network of air passages, and some of them have smooth muscles around them. 
And that's smooth muscle lining allows for their diameter to be controlled. So when you're relaxed, there is an autonomic pathway to the lungs that reduces the diameter of those vessels called the bronchioles. Okay, so you're relaxed, your heart rate is low, your lungs have small air passages. What about digestion? Well, of course, this is a good opportunity for your body to focus on digestion. <clears throat> we have a variety of um, efferent outputs here. There's increased motility. That refers to the peristalsis and churning, uh, peristalsis along the GI tract and churning in your stomach. Okay, all the smooth muscles that line the GI tract are more active when you are relaxed by virtue of this pathway. In the small intestine, we have uh, the release of digestive enzyme into the gut lumen, the center of the gut. That helps with the digestion. Then as nutrients are absorbed, we have an increase in glucose in the blood and insulin is a hormone that signals to the body that that glucose should be packaged away into cells in the form of glycogen or fats. And that storage allows that source of energy to be used later on when you become more active. Now these two outcomes <clears throat> are orchestrated by the pancreas. So there's a couple of regions of the pancreas both of which are innervated with these pathways. You also generally don't want to have to urinate when you're running around uh, and your body therefore prioritizes the, produce, uh, the production of urine and the, t the um, stress that's in the walls um, of your urinary bladder increases. And that's because that those walls are made of smooth muscle and they tend to increase their tension in response to uh, this, this pathway. Relaxation is required for sexual arousal. And so another one of sex organs, this is either the penis in the case of uh, males or the clitoris in the case of females. Um, those organs become erect um, as a response to this, this pathway here. All right, so all of these pathways are similar. We can see that you've got two neurons in each case, and we've got this something that I haven't explained yet that's in between. Okay, these all look pretty similar. These pathways are known as parasympathetic pathways. So you can think of parasympathetic pathways as the division of the autonomic nervous system that stimulates rest and digest functions. Okay, they're basically these housekeeping functions that are ideally most active when you're relaxed. So let's talk about the um, <clears throat> parasympathetic pathway in a bit more detail. So here we have our central nervous system, our spinal cord, and our brain. Um, the autonomic nervous system includes this parasympathetic pathway. Now for all of the autonomic pathways, they act on a suite of effector organs. So those include smooth muscles, not skeletal muscles, cardiac muscle, so your heart, glands, and adipose tissue, fat tissue. The parasympathetic pathway acts on those uh, targets, those efferent organs, uh, with this pathway of two neurons. Okay, so now I'm gonna explain what that rectangle is. This is a ganglion. So this neuron resides within a nerve. A nerve has um, a series of neurons that are all running parallel. And what you see if you trace a neuron for the parasympathetic nervous system is that there's an enlargement of that neuron at a certain point. And that is positioned close to the, the, the cells um, where this, uh, we have this chemical synapse here. That enlargement is created because of the cell bodies of the second interneuron here, 
and um, and it also includes the chemical synapse from the first uh, neuron. So that's known as a ganglion. A ganglion is a bundle of cell bodies, and it's one of the characteristics of the parasympathetic pathway that you have it really close to the organ. Another characteristic is the second neuron releases the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. Okay, the, the particular neurotransmitters are important because they allow us in part to distinguish these different pathways. Although acetylcholine also happens to be used by the somatic um, efferent pathway. That's not an autonomic pathway. And, um, and so they both share that uh, characteristic. What other autonomic pathways exist? Well, parasympathetic pathways are the ones that are active when you are relaxed. The other two are active when you're not, when you're either stressed out or really active or both. The first is called the sympathetic pathway. They also have a ganglion, but the ganglion is positioned close to the spinal cord. And the neurotransmitter that emerges from the second neuron is called norepinephrine. The final pathway is called the adrenal sympathetic pathway. And it serves to excite this organ, this gland called the adrenal medulla. The adrenal medulla is positioned atop the kidneys. Okay, this is your right kidney, this is your left kidney. There's the adrenal medulla. Why the kidneys? Well, the kidneys are highly vascularized. Okay, we'll talk about how they filter uh, your blood to produce urine later. Uh, just know that um, the, <clears throat> this artery here is really close to the heart. It is a major artery, and therefore there's lots of blood flow. Why does that matter? Well, the adrenal medulla serves to release a hormone known as epinephrine, okay, which you might know as adrenaline. That's the same thing. Epinephrine gets dumped into the bloodstream where it's circulated through the body, and it can reach the whole body uh, remarkably fast. Now, you can think of epinephrine and its release almost like a radio transmission through the body, but that transmission is only received by the cells that have like a radio, you know, and the equivalent of a radio in this analogy is a receptor for epinephrine. So we see there's little receptors here shown in green for norepinephrine that's right at the chemical synapse on the postsynaptic cell. You've got those receptors are ligand gated. Uh, then you've got acetylcholine down here. For epinephrine, <clears throat> there is one type of receptor called the beta-2s that are really sensitive to epinephrine. There's no sensitivity to norepinephrine. So if you have a cell that has a beta-2 receptor, you know that it is specialized for responding, or at least that receptor is specialized for responding to the release of epinephrine. Now that cell may also have <clears throat> beta-1 receptors. Beta-1 receptors are generalists. They're, they can respond both to norepinephrine and epinephrine. They're not particularly sensitive to either one of them. So this is the benefit of being a specialist. Uh, the beta-2s, you can have higher sensitivity. The generalist beta-1s have lower sensitivity. It's kind of the trade-off, but <clears throat> As a generalist, it can respond to either one. So you, if you have beta ones positioned at this chemical synapse along the sympathetic pathway, that receptor could be activated either through the release of norepinephrine from the presynaptic cell or through the circulation of epinephrine that comes from the adrenal medulla. Okay, either one can activate the beta ones. And that brings us to the final receptor, which is a specialist for norepinephrine. So it has no epinephrine sensitivity. The alpha receptors only respond to the release of norepinephrine. Okay, so, so the sympathetic and adrenal sympathetic are two pathways that have some similarities. They definitely have a strong similarity in function. So together, they the sympathetic, sympathetic autonomic responses are active in stressful fight or flight conditions, okay? If you're being chased by a bear, 
then your sympathetic and adrenal sympathetic pathways are active. And by having two sympathetic pathways, it allows for responses to be either localized, that is through the release of norepinephrine by a presynaptic um, sympathetic axon, can activate individual cells and not have the rest of the body know about it. On the other hand, the release of epinephrine can be body-wide. Any receptor that has either a beta-1 or a beta-2 can respond to that stimulus. So if we return to our table of organs and responses, we can add the sympathetic pathways to that. So here AS is the adrenal sympathetic. So we're going to itemize the responses in these various organs when you're in a fight or flight situation. Again, being chased by a bear as an example. Some of these are merely the opposite of the parasympathetic response. So that's the case for the heart, sort of. For the heart, sympathetic activity causes an elevation in beat frequency. That's acting on those pacemaker cells that I mentioned. But it also acts on contractile cells in the interest of increasing stroke volume. And both those pacemaker cells and contractile cells have beta-1 receptors. All right, so from the previous slide, if you study that slide, then you'll, you'll know that if I tell you a particular receptor, what hormone or neurotransmitter that cell is going to be responsive to. So for the beta-1s, that's the generalist receptor, it responds to both norepinephrine and epinephrine. So either pathway, either sympathetic pathway, can activate those cells and cause an increase in beat frequency and stroke volume. Now, you have blood vessels everywhere in the body. When you're in a fight-or-flight situation, you want blood flow to skeletal muscles. You don't want blood flow to your small intestine. Okay, This is not the time to absorb nutrients. That's for when I'm relaxed. Okay, So the way that your body controls blood flow is by increasing or decreasing the diameter of blood vessels. Again, details will follow. Um, we want the blood vessels to the skeletal muscles to increase in diameter. We want the ones that feed the digestive system to decrease in diameter. Okay, so there's a variety of responses depending on where they're positioned that can either result in increases or decreases in diameter. Blood vessels have both alpha receptors and or beta-2 receptors. Now in your lungs, where when you're relaxed, it's okay for the air passages to be small in diameter. We don't want the resistance that comes with that when we are running away from the bear. So in response to sympathetic inputs, and in this case, um, it's just the adrenal sympathetic because they have beta twos. In response to that, there's an increase in the diameter of the bronchioles. Those are the vessels that, um, that bring air into the, um, the exchange surfaces in the lungs. The GI tract should not be particularly active. So there's a decrease in motility in response to that. There's a decrease in insulin secretion because we actually want glucose to be in the bloodstream. We don't want to be packaging it away, which is what insulin does. We're going to reduce the secretion of those enzymes. We'll keep that for when the GI tract is active. All right, so that's all uh, responses that emerge from the pancreas. Sweat glands in your skin become activated. You increase sweating. That's in anticipation of the exercise as you're running. Fat cells are going to initiate the breakdown of fat so that you can use fatty acids as a substrate for producing ATP in your cells. Okay, we got beta 1s and beta 2s on the job for that. Urination. Now, some folks will say like, well, what about the folks that get extremely stressed out and pee their pants? I don't have an answer for that exactly, but under normal, not extreme circumstances, 
if you're running away from the bear, you're not really thinking about urinating. And so um, the sympathetic inputs via alpha and beta-2 receptors will cause a reduction in bladder wall tension. So what you see here is in some cases for certain organs, uh, the sympathetic pathways um, have no parasympathetic equivalent. And this is the one that should have come first. Some sympathetic responses are the opposite of parasympathetic. So in the case of urination, parasympathetic he says, yes, I want to urinate. Sympathetic does the opposite. All right, there are a lot of parts here. What I don't want you to do is to try to memorize this table. Instead, you want to be familiar with this. Okay, if you've got the parasympathetic autonomic nervous system being active, that's associated with a relaxed state. And you want to be familiar if I told you, oh, you're, uh, you've got high peristalsis in your small intestine, that shouldn't be surprising. Okay. Um, and on the flip side, you'll want to be familiar with which organ systems um, are, are most active when there are sympathetic inputs and exactly what the nature of that activity is. Um, and then finally, you want to be able to interpret the functional significance of these different types of receptors. Okay, that content was in the previous slide. So if we've got a beta 2, beta 1, or an alpha, what does that mean in terms of either epinephrine or norepinephrine sensitivity. All right, so that provides the big picture on the various, the, the three major components of the autonomic nervous system. Now, even though all of those pathways reside in the periphery, they are activated by the central nervous system. So I just wanna to touch on the centers of the brain that activate these pathways because I'm gonna be mentioning them over and over again in the future. Okay, so this brings us to these autonomic brain centers. Autonomic pathways are controlled by a variety of integration centers. I will mention and already have mentioned in the case of thermoregulation, the hypothalamus. And we see a CT scan on the right that highlights the hypothalamus. It's that little heart-shaped um, piece of the brain. It's associated with the anterior pituitary. We'll get into that later. Um, the other major sections are in the brain stem. So that includes the pons. We see that highlighted in red there. And the medulla oblongata, which we see uh, more ventrally on the brainstem. 